how do we, or how would one follow through on the hypothesis that I put forward? A, that there are human looking non-humans that are here or human looking aliens, whatever. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Do you, do you force people to take a blood test, a genetic test? Is that what this is about? Uh, you know, sometimes we you could speculate, is there a behind the scenes covert effort in the intelligence community to find these people out? Like if, I mean, this is all spy novel stuff, but what if it's true? Um, if you are in a responsible position and you, you know this is true, or you believe this is true, you would want to find out who they are. And um, I remember I had a conversation with Nick Redfern, who's a great researcher, I mean, one of the best. And Nick's had stories like this of human looking non-humans. And on one occasion, he definitely came across a story where within the UK military, the British military, uh, there was a conversation about the difficulty in dealing with these human-looking non-humans. Um, it's a story, but I think Nick, I think he stands by it. So if if that were the case, you'd want to find a way to do it. And how and how would you do it without them knowing you're doing it? Uh, because obviously, if they're infiltrated, I mean, it just gets crazy. It's it's almost like a, a sci-fi series that was made for TV, but it could be real. Uh, but I don't know how, I don't have the answer to what you're asking and some smart person could come up with some ideas. I don't know what they are, uh, but I, I think that's true. I think that is true. And are you, I guess, cause that kind of comes back to the, the hope when it comes to the field of ufology, um, being hopeful that there can be answers um, or things might just remain you know, fairly stagnant for a long period of time. We've definitely gone through many years of that. Um, in a way, I guess you would right. have been able to take advantage of that in some ways. Um, well, there, there's one there. thing. You know, there's there's more to ufology than just disclosure. Like uh, when Philip Class was around, he's the great UFO skeptic and uh, had the the gift of being able to really annoy all the genuine UFO researchers. <laughs> but he had something called his. Uh, I think he called it his UFO curse. And the curse, he said, was, if you're a believer in UFOs, he said, by the time you die, you won't know any more than you know now. That's the curse. And I think, you know, classic class, he got it all wrong. He got it wrong in, on two levels. A, we actually, I think we do know more than we've known in the past. I think we are making progress. But B, I, my feeling is, it's, it is, this sounds corny as anything, but the journey is the thing. It's like, that's the reward. Uh, I've spent 25 years in this. You spent at least 25, I think, or a long time in this field. And you get a lot out of it. Like you get you get a tremendous depth of understanding of the world that would not have come, certainly would not have come to me in any other way. It was like the there's, there's different tools that can wedge open the, a, a door that slammed shut. But for me, it was UFOs. It was recognizing, once I pry that open just enough, I realized... There were many other elements of this world that I thought uh, that I believed in my youthful naivete that turned out not to be true. And so the UFO subject really was an opener for me. It was an, an, an enabler and uh, I'm thankful for it. So that's the thing. Like, in my opinion, like I, like I said, I don't like being lied to. I don't like when my government lies to me. I don't like when corporations hide truth from me. And so I would like for all of that to come out. But I also feel that the very fact of having been diving into the subject for so long has been incredibly rewarding and enriching in my, in my world, in my life. And I can't even express how lucky I feel that I've been able to and continue to do this. So, uh, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm still fascinated by the subject. And I actually don't expect that I will have all of the answers I want, you know, by the time I check out. I just don't think that. Uh, and honestly, I'm okay with that. I, I want to learn as much as I can learn and enjoy the ride. Speaking of uh, somebody who's been in this field for a long, long time, and uh, like many people before him, you know, will probably not get all the answers that he wants. Uh, this question keeps getting asked a lot. And I mean, 
it represents a lot of misunderstanding about some of these people and organizations. But uh, here's the question. Jacques Vallée isn't a U.S. citizen, and yet he was brought well into the aviary, the working group, et cetera, with John Alexander, Bigelow, Kit Green, Hal Putoff, Pandolfi, and others. What is your understanding of how he was admitted into the inner circle to the point that they talked to him enough that they could, uh, that he could write all he has written, especially mm -hmm. in Forbidden Science? Well, we should ask Vallée. I, I don't think he would be uh, have a problem with answering that, but I'll give you my best answer. I didn't know he wasn't an, uh, at least a dual citizen, though. I have to confess, he's still a French citizen. But Valet, you know, came over to work with Heineck. Now, how that happened, that's an interesting thing to ask. How in the mid-60s, Jacques Valet was a young man, but he was able to hook up with Alan Heineck and they became fast friends. That I know. And, well, uh, Valet ended up, like he started out, he wrote actually two really good books on ufology, anatomy of a phenomenon, particularly, I think it was 1965. And if anyone goes back to read that book, they'll find it's actually one of the finest UFO books of that decade. It's a really good book. Everyone talks about Passport to Magonia and some of his later ones, but his very first book is a great book. Uh, and so he really established his credibility right out of the gate with that. And then and he's he helped the, the French get their program started, Jay Pond. I mean, he helped yes, Claude right. O'Hare yes. do a study on UFOs that led to the beginning of Japan, uh, the French. Yes. The other thing about Valet is that he's just so damn smart. Yeah. I mean, he's so, I mean, he's clearly of a high order of intelligence and he, he belongs in those circles. Like for those people, like he knew Heineck, he knows the field. He's a genuine intellectual with the UFO subject. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever one thinks about Valet, he's he's a true heavy duty thinker who has come up with quite a few really fresh original perspectives on the subject. I don't know if I agree with all of them, but to me, what his value has been is in jarring open some really fresh perspectives on ufology. And he's always thoughtful. Um, so I think that's what it was. And he's, uh, you know, I think it's his initial book, his work with Heineck. And the fact that he's just a smart guy, it's not surprising at all that, and you know, the aviary is not a, an official anything. It's an informal right. collection of, of guys. They, get, they were given the name by Bill Moore, the researcher who was researching all, you know, he was diving in and looking into all of these guys with government connections who clearly knew a lot about UFOs. And in his conversations with Jamie Chandray, they were so spooked on the phone, they gave all of these people bird names and more quipped, well, they're the aviary. Mm -hmm. And that's that's literally, so like you could be in the aviary and not even know you're in the aviary. Which that's, some of them were, because a lot of them, from my correct. understanding, were people they wanted to get in contact with, but wouldn't, in some right. cases, particularly John Alexander, stay flat, flat out, even though he's considered an aviary, he never wanted to give them the time of day. He didn't feel they were credible and in my opinion, I think he turned out to be right. Well, I thought Alexander actually, I mean, I once <laughs> asked put off privately is like, why do you even bother with this guy? Uh, I've had my fill of John Alexander over the years. And, um, but I think, uh, I mean, Alexander knows Bigelow quite well. And he was, mm -hmm. I believe he was associated with NIDS back at least in the early days. So he's part of it too. But, but the thing is what we call the aviary is, I think really you can say they were a loose collection of guys who they kind of knew each other. They were friends, uh, a fellow named Ernie Keller Strauss, who no one even talks about anymore. And he was really one of the early leaders of that group. Keller Strauss apparently worked out at Nevada. He's with the air force, had a lot of information about what was going on there, at least rumors and leaks. And they, they collected around him and other people, Kit Green and Hal Putoff and Alexander. I think Alexander's nickname in the Avery was Penguin, if I'm not mistaken, or Chickadee, one or the other. And on and on and on. Robert Collins is Condor and so forth. But they're not, they're not like an organization, a formal thing. They're a collection. So I think that's really what we're talking about.